You know, uh, hang on, Mike, I'm gonna get you. I told you I was gonna get you. I, a lot of families, they like to, for recreation, they like to fish. Does your family like to fish? Our, ours does, we like to, like to fish, and uh, we'll spend hours out there searching and for the right place, you know, you get your depth finder, you get your fish finder, you find those little honey holes, they call them. You find those little holes where the fish are, are just hanging out, and, you, and then you, you work on finding the right bait. Now, this, just so you know, there's no, there's no hook on that, all right? I didn't mean to scare you. There ain't no hook on that. I ain't catching anything with that. It's just for show right now, okay? This is a little show I'm putting on. But I got some skills here. So, you know, we find that right spot, then you throw it in there, and then nothing's biting, and so you work on finding the right bait. So you, you, you change your lure a bunch of times. Hang on, Mike, I'm moving back at you again. See, I told you I wouldn't hit you. I'm pretty good at this, aren't I? I'm impressing myself. Reminds me of the time during one of our Christmas productions, I was throwing candy to some kids, and one kid wasn't looking, I threw a bag of candy right in his head. He's never celebrated Christmas since. So, so we, we take all this time and effort to go, you know, get the right kind of fishing lures, the right kind of fishing poles, the whole thing. You find out, you know, what they're biting on. You finally, you finally catch them. And then just like with us, I don't know if you guys do this, but just like with us, you know, we're, we're real careful. We'll take the hook out of its mouth and make sure we don't hurt the fish. And, you know, if the fish is real pretty, we might give it a little kiss, you know, take a picture with it. Do you take pictures with your fish? We do. We take fish. You know, before, you know, I, when I grew up fishing, we never took pictures of our fish. We just caught them. But nowadays, you gotta take pictures of everything. We take pictures with our fish and try to make it look like they're a lot bigger than they really are, you know? <laughs> so, but then we do this crazy thing. We catch them, and then we release them. See, all, all this effort to catch the thing, then you release them. It's kinda like what the Lord does with you and I. He catches us, then real carefully, he takes the hook out of our mouth, and then he releases us and all that he has for us in life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thanks for loving us, for caring for us, for having an awesome plan for our life. Lord, as we now turn to your word, I ask you to give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you and of your will. Help us to be all we can be for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So hopefully you brought a Bible with you, so if you have, open it up, turn it on, whatever you do. I'll go over to Luke chapter uh, 19. And look with me at verse 10. I want to talk to you this morning about your relationship with Jesus and really what that's all about and how that really frames your whole life. Everything comes from this. And so i got to fundamentally connect with how he connects with us and his purpose for us. Jesus said this about himself. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. He came to seek and to save. We could say this way, he came, he came to catch us. He came to seek us. He came to catch us so he could save us. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he's talking about you. He's talking about you. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. Those are the two most important words of that verse is seek and save when it comes to understanding our relationship with God. The first word is seek. Jesus came to seek us out. He was proactive in his approach, which means that God is after us. He's always been after this relationship with, with you and I. Even before we realized our need for him, he was after us. The second word is the word saved. Jesus came to seek and to save. He did more than just save us from something. He saved us to something. In other words, he's He's got a plan to take us away from sin and bring us into life, to transfer us from death to life, to what we couldn't have, to what we could have, to what's not available, to what's possible, to what's not possible, to what's possible. All these things that come to us through our relationship with Jesus. He came to seek and save those who are lost. It seems like there's probably two different kinds of lost people. There were those who are lost and they know it. That was the case with me. I, I grew up going to church and so I had a, a knowledge, let's say, about God. I can't say I knew him, but I had a knowledge about him. But it wasn't really a part of my life. 
I wasn't connected to him. I, 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 but I knew that I was lost until I came into a realization in my early 20s that I really was lost and I needed to change direction in my life and that I was a sinner and needed to be saved and I realized that I was unable to do that myself, that the changes I wanted in my life I couldn't do myself. I needed divine intervention. I needed divine help. The other kind of lost person are those who, um, who don't know it. They don't know they're lost. They're, they're the ones that are so full of self-righteousness that, uh, that they're clueless. That might be you. You might be here today and visiting the church. Maybe you've been coming for a while, but you just think, you know, this whole Jesus thing is good for all of you folk, but I'm, I'm good. See, when I was lost, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't need Jesus, but I knew some folks who did. You know what I'm saying? They needed some help. I didn't need help. They, they needed help. I knew my time would come. There was a sense in my life, even as a, as a young man, full of sin, partying the whole nine yards, that I, I, I knew at some point I was going to turn my life around. I knew at some point that I would connect with God. So whether you're lost and you know it or you're lost and you don't know it, Jesus came to save both. He, he came to give his life for, for both of us and whoever, whatever condition that we were in, he first catches us and then he, like I said earlier, he, he release, releases us, hence the title for today's message. Have you ever wondered why that when you, when you do commit your life to Christ, when you do ask Jesus to come into your heart, however you want to say it, you know, you confess him as Lord, you're born again, you ever wondered why you just don't die and go to heaven? Like if, if the ultimate thing is to, is to go to heaven when you're saved, wouldn't it be better just to confess him as Lord and then just go to heaven? Like, wouldn't that be awesome? It, it, it changed the end of church services. That's certainly true. <laughs> you know, we'd have to get Langley on the phone. You know, Norm, yeah, got another dozen here. Come pick them up. But, but there's a reason that, that we stay on the planet when we're born again. And the reason is that God didn't create the earth for him. He created the earth for us. He created the earth for mankind to populate it and then to dominate it. And so really, that's never changed. The plan of that has never changed. That's why he, we're here. He wants us to live a life on this planet dominating things and enjoying the life that he's always meant for us. One day Jesus came to two brothers, Peter and Andrew, and they were in the fishing business. Now these guys weren't just casual fishermen. They, 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 this was their business. Their, their, their family was in the fishing business and I'm sure they'd been in the fishing business for generations. And Jesus came up to them, and here's what he said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. He called out to them. He said, come and follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. They left their nets at once, and they followed him. More than likely, they knew Jesus. More than likely, they had heard him preach before. And because they had heard him preach, that in other words, how can they hear unless there's a preacher? You know that verse in Romans 10. Obviously, they'd heard something that had pre-stirred their hearts because their response to Jesus calling them out was immediately to leave where they were to follow him. Well, that just doesn't make any sense unless there was something going on in their heart. They'd heard something. They'd, they'd been ministered to. So the question is, what was Jesus preaching? What was the message? And that's what I want to share with you because the message that Jesus preached to Peter and, and Andrew is the same message that Jesus is preaching today. It's the same thing. In other words, that's one of the things I love about, about mathematics is mathematics uh, doesn't change. You know, two plus two always equals four. I, I love that about things of, of that, that discipline because so many other things in life change. You know, coffee's either good for you or it's bad for you. You know, it's, you need this, for this, all that stuff. There's varying opinions. But you don't have opinions about math, right? It's just two plus two equals four or whatever. Well, there's something to the gospel message that is this way. That it's a consistent message. And in fact, the message has been consistent 
for 2,000 years. It's the same message. Jesus began to preach this message, and it's the same message that's being preached today, or, or at least should be. And here's that message. If, you, you're, if you're there, following your Bible, if you're there in Matthew 4, back up to verse 17. Here's what it says. From then on. Everybody say, from then on. From then on, meaning from that point on when Jesus came out of the wilderness, began to minister, this is what he said. This, is, this was his message. And from then on, continued on, after he went to heaven, after he was crucified, was buried, was raised from the dead, went to heaven, his disciples, this was their message. And this is our message today. Here's the message. Repent of your sins, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Let's read this together, could we? One, two, three. From then on, Jesus began to preach. Repent of your sins, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, you say, where have you been all summer? I've been preparing to give you these three points all summer long. That's all I've been working on. Been a short summer. But if I can't get you to remember these three things, how can we remember anything? That's why when the kids are small, I'd, I'd get the math tables, you know, the, 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 the two plus two or the, or the multiplication tables. The kids all learned the multiplication tables when they were really young because I, I taught them to them. This is the same kind of thing, the same principle. Here's what it is. You ready? Repent, turn to God, for the kingdom of God is near. For the purpose of this message, I'll make it even simpler for you by using our words, ours. You ready? Like reading, arithmetic, you know, math, you know whatever. Okay, <laughs> here's the R. R repent, return, recognize. Y'all ready? Let's do it again. On the count of three. One, two, three. Repent, return, Boom. Want to go to breakfast? <laughs> That's all I got, really. Well, I got a few more things to share with you about that. But those are the three things. But you say, okay, yeah, okay, that's how you get started in this whole thing. No, no, that's how you finish this whole thing. You, you start with it, then you finish it. You, you start your life with this, and you finish your life with this. This is the message. This is the message of the gospel. Let me, oh, I haven't got to the good part yet. So here's, here's, the, here's the three things. Repent, return, and recognize. Number one, repent. Repent in the, in, for this series is the catch stage. This is where the Lord catches us. In other words, we didn't get saved on our own account. The Holy Spirit drew us into this relationship we have with God. We recognized our need for a Savior. Uh, and, and so when we did that, we invited Jesus into our, our hearts. If you haven't done that, we're going to do that at the end of the service. And like I say, you won't instantly die, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Romans 2.4 says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? To turn you from your sin. What does it mean to repent? The word actually means to, 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 to turn or, or, or really, truly, it means this. It means after giving something some consideration, you change your mind. You change your mind. You were thinking one way, and then you changed your mind. I know for me, I, I was in part of my life. I didn't need Jesus in my life. I didn't need God. Then I changed my mind and said, I do. You all with me? You did the same thing. However it was for you, at some point you repented. You changed your mind. You changed the way you, you thought. See, for quite a while, I was pretty self-sufficient. Uh, and, and so when it comes to our relationship with God, this idea of repenting is, uh, is a starting point, but it's something we should do every day because it's a reminder that we have to think like God thinks. We have to think God thoughts. We've got to turn to him, not try to figure everything out ourselves. Uh, and it's, I think it's harder for us guys than it is for women. I don't mean that disrespectfully at all, but women will ask for directions. 
Why would we think a guy who won't ask a person for directions has any need for God in his life? So if he won't ask Charlie for directions, why would he ask God for directions? But that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to always be asking God, God, what do you want? God, what, what's the best way? What do you, what's your mind on this? What's your wisdom on this? Help us ask. We want your guidance on this. Not, we're not going to come up with some idea ourselves. Help us with it. So repenting is simply just changing the way that you think. I love the verse in Romans 12, too. It says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. What's he talking about? Repenting, changing the way we think. Then you'll learn how to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. What's another way of explaining repenting? Well, probably the best way is is this. Stop doing your thing and start doing God's thing. Stop doing your thing and start doing God's thing. What's God's thing in your life? What would God want you to do with your life? How would he want to, you to invest your time and your energies? Proverbs 3, 5 says this. I, I love this. It's been one of my foundational verses for life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Some translations say lean on your own understanding. But seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. Again, this is something more than just a one-time occurrence. This is not a, a, a one-time thing. This is, this is a, something we do every day. God, I, I, I don't depend on my own understanding. I, I lean into you. I'm, I'm asking you for help. Proverbs 16, 9 says, we can make our plans, but God determines our steps. We can make our plans, but, but God's the one who determines our steps. And so this is where faith comes in. This idea that every day we're going to trust God, to, that he's got a, a better plan for our lives than we do, that he's got a way for us to take. He's going to direct our paths. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, which brings us to number two. That's this idea of turning to God, or in our case, to make it easy to remember, return to God. Because again, we're coming back into a relationship we should have had all along, but that relationship was severed because of sin, but we got reconnected with him through Jesus Christ. So to truly repent, we need to turn from something to, to really someone. That someone is Jesus. And see, that's the plan that God has had for us all along. It's, it's a divine partnership. We were meant to have a partnership with God. In other words, let me, let me make it even more real to you. One is you and God together. First, you were alone. Then through Jesus, you came in connection with the Father. And then by God's grace, he connected you with other believers in a local church. That's us, collectively. We're all here together. We're a collective force uh, together. So it's always been about partnership. So the question is, what is... God's plan for you is supposed to look like. It starts with, with us and what we're seeking. I don't know about you, but I, I sought a lot of different things in life. I sought money. I sought position. I sought the party life, you know, excitement and, and the high life, the, you know, all that stuff until ultimately I found out that all of them were dead ends that I was seeking the wrong thing. Maybe you're here today and you've been seeking the wrong thing, trying to find satisfaction. But what did Jesus say? He said in Matthew 6, seek the kingdom of God above all else. But above all else, put your focus on God. Live righteously and he, God, will give you everything that you need. In other words, we got our, we got our eyes on the wrong thing, focused on the wrong thing. Thing. So we had to repent, change our thinking, and turn to God. Jesus said it this way. This, this makes sense when you understand his purpose. In, in John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said this. He said, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose, he said, is to give you a rich and satisfying life. Think about it uh, in the natural. If I'm fishing, it's, it's all about me. I catch a fish, throw it in a bucket, and, and, you know, end of story. But that's not what happens with the Lord. Because with me, when I catch a fish, even if I catch it and release it, 
we don't add any value to the fish other than we've spared its life. In other words, if I, if I catch a bluegill, I'm not going to snip off its, its fins and put on the fins of a walleye and say, let me give you, let me, in fact, let me give you the teeth of a pike. This is going to really help you in life. Because if, if you could swim like a walleye and bite like a pike, you might have a chance of life. I can do nothing to the fish only then to spare its life. But, but here's the good news of Jesus. You ready for this? When he catches us, he doesn't release us in, until he's changed us. He's empowered us. If any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he, he becomes a new creature. He, he becomes different. That's, that's when Jesus releases us into the world to, to fulfill our destiny in, in life. In fact, if we had any clue about how great it is to know the Lord and how great it is in, in what he'll do in our lives to change us, adjust us, and, and, and make us different, we'd be like these fish. Take a look. <laughs> now that's never happened to me, okay? But I'm open to it. So again, it, that's what we should be like when we come to a relationship with the Lord. It should not be something that's just a part of our life. Being a follower of Jesus is everything. And we want to wake up in the morning and go, God, I want to jump in your boat. I don't want to fish alone. I don't want to just swim by myself. I want to get in your boat. So let's get in the boat. So number one, what, what we're doing, number one? Number two? Uh -huh. Number three, recognize God's presence in your life. This could be my favorite. It's like that, you ever feel lonely? I do, lots of times. I feel lonely, you know, surrounded by people, have a wonderful wife, great kids. A lot, sometimes I feel lonely, and then I'm reminded that God's always with us. James 4.8 says it this way, uh, this great verse. It says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. He's talking about getting this new way of thinking. Come close to God. Now, you know, we know that God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere all the time. So when, 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 when the writer says, come close to God and God will come close to you, it, it's not really, um, it, it sort of paints the wrong picture because God's always been there. What are we saying? We're saying, live with an awareness of God's presence. And again, we, we practice his presence when we come together corporately. Like there was, as I mentioned earlier, this morning during worship, there was a sense, and I know you just sense it, a sense of God's presence. More than just, hey, we really hit that note well, you know. There was more than that. It was, it was something more. There was a sense of the reality of God in the room. But you know, you can have a reality of God when you go home today at lunch can have a reality of God, you know, if you're going to go out this afternoon and play golf or go fishing or whatever. You can have a sense of the reality of God's presence wherever you are, 24-7. It's not, it's not just here. Here's where we practice it. But, but this isn't where, you know, we, we take that, what we've learned here, and we, we, we practice it out there in the world in our jobs, in our, in our careers. We, we practice sensing and realizing the Lord's presence because he's with us. And when he's with us, we're, we're more than just ourselves. When he's around, there's more of us because there's more of him. There's a strength that comes in that. Look over with me at Isaiah 55. See, so how is it that we can lean into God's presence? How can we lean into the things of God? Well, if God is, is proactive in our relationship, remember, again, those first two words were seek and save, meaning God has always been proactive in his relationship with us. He's always wanted to have this connection with us. In Isaiah 55, it talks about uh, that, that very thing. And, and really everything we've been talking about this morning so far. Verse 6 says this, Seek the Lord while you can find him. Well, that means now. It just means presence. You can find him right now. Call on him now while he is near. Well, he's always near, so you just call upon him. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought 
of doing wrong. What's he talking about? Repenting, about changing the way they think. Let them turn to the Lord. There's that word again. Repent and turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. So every day we start a life and say, God, thank you, first of all, that apart from you, I'm a sinner and I need a savior and you're it. You saved me, you changed my life. He's near us and wants to have a relationship with us. And so it's this idea that it happens when we repent and, we, and when we turn to him. Now look at the next verse, verse eight. God says this about himself. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. Now, now as I say these things, listen to what, it, what the, 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 the reality of this. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. And for most of us, we'd say, what? Amen to that, right? We'd say, of course, God, you're amazing. You're, you're uh, uh, omniscient, meaning you're, uh, you, you know everything. You're not only omnipresent, but you're omniscient. You know, what, you know everything. So, of course, your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts higher than mine. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Well, amen. Yes. Agree. But that doesn't help us. To acknowledge that God's smarter than us doesn't help us. But a proactive God, one who really desires us to have a, a, a full and satisfying life, what would he want for us? He would want us to tap into his ways and his thoughts, right? That would, that would, that would be what he'd want for us. He'd want us to know his thoughts. He'd, he'd want us to know his ways. That's why we go to prayer and ask God for direction. It's not like we've got to beg him for direction. Why? Because he proactively wants to give us direction. So how do you know that? Well, look at the next verse, verse 10. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. What's he saying? He's saying that his thoughts and his ways, which of course we know are found in his word, come down from heaven and they stay on the ground the ground in this case is us and our hearts. It comes from heaven, comes into our hearts, and it causes us to grow and produce seed and, and, and food. It, it produces life for us. What? This connecting to God, this connecting to his thoughts and his ways. So just like the, the rain wasn't made to be stored in heaven, neither is God's wisdom, his ways, and his thoughts. They're made to come down into our lives. Somebody say amen to that. So then we need to learn to be aware of his presence because when we're aware of his presence, it helps us stay focused on his purpose for our lives. You may be familiar with the old movie called The Chariots of Fire. Not an old movie. It's an old movie for me, but it's from the 1980s. So that might be not old for some of us. It's a, there was a, uh, this, this movie, Chariots of Fire, is a story about a devout Christian. He was a I think a Scottish Presbyterian, but he just loved God, and his family was a ministry family. But he was a wonderful athlete. His name was Eric Little, was his name. He was scheduled to run in the, 2000, the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And his heat to go into the finals was going to be run. He, he ran the 100 meter, and his heat was going to be on a Sunday. And for him and his family, they always honored the Lord Sunday was a church day. It was a day that we did not do other things. You may have come from a religious background. We have some of that around southwest Michigan where a number of years ago they were very strict on what you could or couldn't do on a Sunday. So because of his religious convictions, he, he couldn't run in the heat that would put him in the finals to win a gold medal in the 100, which he was uh, a favorite to win. So he chose not to run it, which of course made a huge stir in the Olympics. But then he was offered an opportunity to run on another day, the 400. Now, back to math. If you run 100, you run it really fast. But if you run the 400, that's four times longer. So you can't run four times longer as fast. Does that make sense? So he wasn't even favored to even place. Wasn't even favored to place or to get a medal. But by God's help and by 
being aware of God's presence by, by believing that God had called him to do this, he, he actually ended up winning the gold medal. It's a wonderful story. Here's a quote from him. You may probably have heard this before. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Now here's what I want you to think about as you sort of wrap this all up. Imagine the God who made heaven and earth, he made you with a plan and a purpose. And when he made you with a plan and a purpose, when you fulfill that plan and you fulfill that purpose and you take those gifts and talents that God's called you to do and you fill those out and you accomplish those things, imagine feeling God's pleasure. Isn't that a great thought? I like something his father said, and again, it comes from this movie. His dad, who was a, uh, was a minister, said this. He said, you can praise God by peeling a spud. That's a potato, for those of you who don't know that. <laughs> if you peel it to perfection. You can praise God by peeling a spud if you peel it to perfection. Don't compromise. Compromise is the language of the devil. Run in God's name and let the world stand back in awe and wonder. I don't know about you, but what if, what if it would be possible for us to fulfill all that God had for us and run our race, do what he's called us to do in such a way that we could feel his pleasure? I'm reminded of a song that we used to sing when, when we were in Bible school. It, 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 it talks about this river of life. Be, because there's a great verse in Psalm 1. It says this, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord. That's what we're talking about here. Meditating on it day and night. What are they doing? They're changing the way they think. They're repenting. They're, 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 they're changing. They're turning to God. They're like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. You know, that's a picture of you and me. Being planted by the river of life that's always flowing, like a tree that's planted by water, always its roots are always getting nourishment. They're always getting fed. That's the way life should be for you and I. Always being fed, always being nourished by God. That's why it's so good to be here together. Because when we come together, we trust God that today, who's ever delivering the message, that God's got a message that's going to bring life into my spirit, life into my heart. This river of life. This song, we used, we used to sing, here's the song. I got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up a well. Within my soul, spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me that life abundantly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word. And we be like trees planted by the river of water. I pray you'll draw all of us close to Jesus. Thank you for it. Amen.